Hi, this is E. David Crawford, Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Urology. A couple of months ago, a colleague and good friend of mine, Dr. Mike Claudet, a medical oncologist from the University of Colorado, informed me about the disparity between men and women with COVID-19. Mike was really ahead of the curve here when he talked about the temporous translocation and a possible etiology for this. So, Mike is going to share with us today his findings and an overview of this and very important matter. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, David. This is a, a very interesting topic. I certainly haven't been involved with the basic science of uh, temporous ERG uh, mutation or translocation, but that fusion is present in 50% or so of prostate cancer patients, and I heard about it in the basic science meetings. Uh, notably, Arul Chanayan is one of the uh, real leaders from Michigan in, in looking at this uh, story. But I think it wasn't just me. I think a lot of people in the prostate cancer field quickly recognized that the Tempest 2 story <clears throat> might have something to do with um, the male-female disparity and the fact that kids may not get the infection and so forth. And I, I uh, looked it up in the basic science uh, literature a little bit. Um, before I sent you that email. And on the next slide um, is sort of the story that comes out. Uh, this was uh, published in 2017, and there's actually uh, earlier publications. But this slide shows the uh, location of the, of the Tempris 2, which is a protease enzyme that, that has to um, by it, it's part of the entry of the virus into the cells. So what happens is this enzyme uh, cleaves the spike protein and then the spike protein is bound to this other uh, protein that's called ACE2. And probably people have heard about that with regards to ACE inhibitors. Uh, and then those two proteins in, in com combination uh, allow the virus to enter the cell and then there are some other potential places where tempers to acts in terms of the maturation of the virus, et cetera. So in the, in the articles that we found, uh, just looking around, this has become a very interesting target. Um, so here's the, uh, the two proteins we're talking about, and you can see they're intimately involved with the virus entering the cell, <clears throat> and there are inhibitors for this. Uh, this one is in clinical trial chemostat, but, um, Tempris 2 and ACE2 are both potentially under the regulation to some extent of androgens. Um, and a lot of people have started looking at that. You have to use very sophisticated techniques like single cell uh, RNA seq technology to see if the two are co expressed and in which cells. If you just grind up a mouse lung, you may not see any differences between male and female mice, et cetera. But when you start looking at single cell levels and uh, ways that these two enzymes or these two proteins are expressed that could be a target uh, to help prevent um, COVID infection. So uh, I was, you know, fascinated by that and shared it with David. And then uh, sure enough, the other people who uh, were looking at this were <laughs> way ahead of us. And uh, an article then appeared um, just, uh, I think, last week or so week and a half ago, looking at the northern, Cal the northern Italy population, um, and they were looked at patients who had cancer or no cancer, and it turned out that cancer patients in general do worse than uh, patients without cancer. And in their study, which is published and referenced there at the bottom, um, there was uh, the ability to look in prostate cancer patients. Here's 5,000 patients with prostate cancer on androgen deprivation therapy, and then another 37,000 patients not on ADT. And you can see that uh, the infection rate of 0.7 per 1,000 compared to 3.1 per 1,000 reached high statistical significance. And then very small number of patients, only four patients, but these patients tended to have mild disease. Uh, uh, and the, the comparison with mild versus severe disease wasn't so impressive. But when they kind of did this per 100,000 population, you can see 76 uh, per 100,000 with an infection compared to 318 per 100,000 with infection. 
just looking at strictly prostate cancer patients on ADT or not on ADT. So it really raised the possibility that this could be a, a target uh, for prevention and maybe even uh, help in curing or uh, shortening the infection rate. And so a number of, of uh, trials have already been launched. Uh, just yesterday, they announced uh, at UCLA a trial in um, uh, prostate, uh, not in prostate cancer patients, but in um, patients who are infected with COVID uh, and starting them on a one-month injection of Degarelix uh, as a phase two trial, I think, at the moment they're, they enter the hospital. So these would be the sickest of patients. And then another possibility would be to consider using a less uh, potent ADT approach that most of the urologists and prostate specialists are familiar with using 5-alpha reductase inhibitor like Proscar or, um, or Avidart in patients at high risk, uh, say nursing homes. So if you had a, a population of people in a nursing home and a couple of people got infected with COVID-19, you could um, start, start the other patients uh, in that nursing home on uh, prevention. Or there are other high-risk populations that you could potentially use uh, Proscar, finasteride, or dutasteride, for example, without the side effects that um, severe ADT using a GNRH analog would use. So I think we're going to see a lot of this um, and uh, many people trying different approaches, and hopefully it will help us get out of this uh, pandemic. Mike, thanks a lot. That was really, uh, really, really interesting stuff. A couple of thoughts um, about this. What about women? Uh, altering the hormone milieu, would that have any possible effect on them since this is testosterone-based? Well, I think that's a great question and quite interesting. It turned out that um, I put this on the blog, on my own blog site for um, the patients that I take care of. I have a blog so that I can try and answer questions that a lot of patients might have all at once and, and uh, save them having, having, saving me having to answer the same question over and over and somebody who read the blog is an andrology guy who's, he's actually a dermatologist, um, Andy Gorin, who I've never met except on the internet. And his interest is in uh, uh, sort of baldness, the, the thing that happens to women as they get older and they have testosterone excess and develop uh, hair loss uh, under the control of androgens. And he... He had had the same idea because he was familiar with the use of Propecia and, um, and anti-androgen uh, therapies in general. And he's already published five or six articles on this hypothesis. So, um, yes, I think older women potentially might have androgen excess and potentially benefit in the same way. But uh, I don't know enough about the androgen metabolism in, in uh, younger women uh, as to whether this would be worthwhile. I think you know, men would probably be the main um, focus of a, of a research effort. Your, your idea of uh, actually using finasteride or uh, dutasteride is, uh, I mean, those would be pretty benign drugs to use for a short period of time um, in nursing homes. And I think that, that, is anybody looking at that right now? Is there, is there a trial uh, that is uh, being considered and using those agents? I know there's one trial that uh, Andy has uh, has proposed, and I'm not sure if it's underway or, or even uh, listed yet. I think it might even be listed at clinicaltrials.gov, but I think, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking in the, in the same way. The question is, you know, finding the right population at high enough risk and getting enough patients, whether you do a, a prospective randomized trial, et cetera. Uh, Gets, gets tricky, but I think that those two drugs are, you know, really benign, and they've been in hundreds of thousands of patients in the PCPT trial uh, and, and other trials. So I think the safety issues would be, would be much better tolerated than giving a, a, a GNRH analog, for example. Yeah. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's very interesting to, to um, uh, consider using Decorelix in, um, in a trial and and I applaud the folks at the VA for for looking at this, and I know there's a lot of other trials going on. So, Mike, listen, thanks a lot for, uh, number one, uh, really being ahead of the curve and uh, 
defining this and educating our group on it. We appreciate it because I'm sure urologists are going to be asked about using uh, the LHRH antagonists and other things that, that we use to ablate and uh, alter T. So have a great day, and thanks a lot for uh, being on with us. All right, and if you have any uh, any urinary obstructive issues, maybe you'd want to start <laughs> finasteride <laughs> or dutasteride. Take care, David. Uh, two for one. Thanks.